Well, thanks very much, and good afternoon. Um, it's, it's really a tremendous pleasure to be here in Tilburg. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks to the dean also for the kind invitation. Um, it's, it really is an honor to be asked to give this year's Montesquieu lecture. And I'd like to use the opportunity to explore law's role in some really puzzling aspects of contemporary global political and economic life. So the widespread sense that the post-war global order or system is somehow giving way to something more chaotic, um, uncertain. Concern about the rise of expert governance uh, or technocracy in world affairs. And of course, also um, the astonishing persistence of injustice and inequality despite everything that we've tried to do uh, to bring them to a better outcome. And my hope is that by exploring law's role in all this, we'll pr I provide something of an antidote to the frustrating feeling that for all their defects, there are really no alternatives to our current um, political programs and institutional reforms, and in fact argue that there are actually alternatives lying all around. Um, and attending to law may be one way to help us identify them and pursue them. So start with the post-war order. It's very hard not to be nostalgic for the idea of a global order centered in the North Atlantic, vouchsafed by a network of legal and institutional arrangements. If you look back on it, it seems pretty attractive. Um, but I think what many people see today is less that order than something chaotic, more struggle, really, than stable order. Power and governance capability are dispersed. Who has an overview? Maybe we imagine only some cadre of elites or experts or people at Davos, something like that. Meanwhile, whole regions of the world seem to be coming unglued. Authoritarian rulers seem newly empowered, flaunting disregard for the values of economic liberalism, democracy, and human rights. Institutions that we thought were somehow central seem disempowered. Uh, the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, the European Union, all are buffeted by economic forces and new political actors. And our national governments are left somehow prostrate by financial constraint, find themselves gridlocked and disempowered. Confidence in the rule of law seems to be ebbing in its as its institutions and normative commitments are weakened in the North uh, and instrumentalized for internecine political struggles across the world. And then within the North Atlantic, the establishment consensus seems newly fragile. Nationalism, populism, Brexit, Trump, Italy, it's no wonder the global commentariat is asking whether the center will hold. Now, it's not clear what happened. Whether the center began to wobble, other powers began to rise, the peripheries became unstable, or people just stopped believing. Maybe all those things together, but there's no question we've lost confidence and have started to talk about the post-war order in the past tense. Well, looking back on it, it's easy to see what made it seem so reassuring, although I think it also does look too good to have been true somehow. Indeed, it was always largely a dream, a dream which I'm afraid also froze our imagination and stunted our powers of reinvention. And as we wake up from this dream, let's see if we can remember some things in the dream. It was a wonderful dream that we're waking up from. I mean, like any order one gets used to, the post-war orders seem natural, stable, when we looked out the window, we thought we could see a political equilibrium of roughly equivalent sovereigns reflected in diplomatic routines and institutions, all coexisting with a global market that was moving resources to their most productive use, as if by an invisible hand. At the same time, in our dreamscape, we thought it was a hard-won situation. It wasn't natural at all. The global market rescued from national protectionism, a legal order wrung from inter-sovereign competition, for political stability to replace war and great power conflict, particularly here in Europe, required enormous commitment and effort, as we constantly reminded ourselves. And after all that effort, there seemed there was no going back. Going back could mean only returning to an unattractive state of nature, to a much worse dream, to World War II, to the economic catastrophes of the Great Depression, to colonialism, to a world of religious wars. Although the post-war order had been many things in its short life, a regime of capital controls and then of free movement, of national economic development and then of open economies, of Cold War division and then of triumphant universalism, there was no exit. It was like the Hotel California, sort of. The hotel could always be reformed, but you could never leave. 
And the order seemed remarkably resilient for all that. It had gotten us through the Soviet era, absorbed decolonization, the 1960s, the oil shock. It had survived repeated global economic crises and wars all around the periphery of the system, as well as dramatic changes in technology, communication, the structure of manufacturing and finance. Why wouldn't it also survive today's challenges? After all, it promised stability even stability in the interests of everybody, a Europe for all Europeans, a global order for all the world. And if American or Western hegemony underwrote the whole thing, this was less a worry than a relief. At least somebody was paying attention to what everybody would require, a kind of benign hegemony for which we should be grateful given the historic opportunities. Well, if you look at all that together, it's a fantastic picture and a wonderful dream. A benevolent global order, pragmatic, problem solving, very difficult to give up. What about inequality and injustice in this picture? Well, more than comfortable stability, the order seemed just, even progressive. The arc of history bending towards liberal values and towards peace, human rights. The way things were, at least here, at least most of the time, prefigured how they might be one day for the whole world. That's why we thought that working for the order and preserving what we built for ourselves was also to work towards a, must, a just future for everybody else. It's not that domination and unequal powers were altogether missing in the dream, but they were somewhere at the margins, outside the order, before the order, beneath the order, conditions to which the order responded. We knew, of course, that there were stronger and weaker powers, developed and underdeveloped societies, leading and lagging sectors, but these were not produced or reinforced by the post-war order. On the contrary, in our dream, we thought the order promised equality. Anybody could join, catch up, participate. Development or modernization was available to any country with the right policy. The global consensus and the institutional arrangements it underwrote were open to anybody with the right values. The trade regime as well, if you joined the WTO and made the necessary concessions, the global financial architecture also, if you managed your national accounts, protected investor rights, and joined the regime of bilateral investment treaties. The European Union, even the Euro, have paths to membership. And even the rule of law could be injected by the development agencies of the North. If outsiders can't be assimilated and normally wir schaffen das, it's only because they present existential threats. Well, this picture suggests a way to understand lagging regions and nations. Some, of course, are existential threats. Terrorists, failed states, deplorables. But most aren't. There are people in the global south who are not yet, or people in the cities and rural byways of the global north who are no longer suited for the rigors of modern life. Some are losers in capitalism's creative destruction, and some have just been overlooked. But each of these groups could be brought along with sensible policies nudging people forward, making sure the path to participation remains open and the social floor is not too far below the last rung on opportunities ladder. The tools for doing this are known, available. All we need is political will to use them, to keep doing what we're doing, but perhaps more so. Of course, many global problems are the unintended consequences of the North Atlantic doing what it's doing externalizing its pollution, its security needs, its military campaigns, and its economic costs. But here, too, the post-war order seemed to offer remedies, another conference, a treaty, technological innovations, corporate social responsibility, social justice activism, the kind of thing that you could do on your summer vacation or as a professional career. And although it should have been clear that none of these remedies were quite up to it, we could be assured by a shared recognition in lagging towns of the American Midwest as well as in emerging markets that were the North Atlantic Center not to hold, there'd be no reason to expect these problems to get any easier. When the order was threatened by backsliding or outsiders, the solution was vigilance, security cooperation, and doubling down on the density of the institutional order. You can see that actually quite strikingly here in Europe, obviously. The only response to an unsatisfactory Europe is more Europe reinforce the boundaries, deepen the institutions. Well, finally, what about law in this picture we had? And the short answer is law was everywhere. If in 1918, people asked whether law was even possible among sovereigns, a century later, legal arrangements had been dispersed across the world. 
providing a common language for problem solving, dispute resolution, regulation, and administration. It had taken 100 years of intellectual and practical work to make law so ubiquitous in our, in our world. The legality of transnational law seemed plausible. And along the way, law was reimagined again and again. The early 20th century notion of international law as a catalog of valid rules agreed by sovereigns and interpreted by international jurists was modified and augmented by a series of new ideas. First, a move to principles and purposes. Where codified rules couldn't be settled, jurists could find solutions elsewhere in private law analogies, social observations about the nature of international society, deductions from the idea of sovereignty itself. And then a more sociological turn, less norms than modes of interaction, processes, procedures for handling claims, defining actors and understanding the normative implications of horizontal sovereign to sovereign activity. By mid-century, norms could be found in social life. And what were enforced as norms, interpreted as norms, seemed persuasive as norms in a rough and tumble policy process underwritten by shared values. And then we came to embrace a more functional, problem-solving family of legal ideas. Law is what works in a new focus on substantive results, redefining the regulatory, administrative, and dispute settlement functions of a government as activities that could be done anywhere by anybody. Governance, new governance. In our exuberant moments, we might even have thought that wherever two are gathered in its name, there's law. And anyway, maybe law is more symbol than substance a shared consciousness that could be shocked, a measuring rod for legitimacy, the expression of a universal civilization. OK, across the 20th century, that's a lot of intellectual innovation. The result was a grab bag of diverse ideas about what law is, how it functions, and the role it can play in global affairs. Diverse, even inconsistent ideas, which can be picked up strategically by actors. But along the way, some unfortunate notions about law were also dug more firmly into our consciousness. First, a forgetfulness of the kind that often happens in dreams, here of pluralism and diversity. Contradictions and conflicts were, one imagined, domesticated, turned into contending principles or interests that could be balanced, disputes to be settled. And on that basis, there was or might soon be something we could think of as an international order expressing the commitments of an international community, and beyond that, only outlaws and scary others. Now, there were different pictures of that order, the way it balanced differences within itself and excluded differences external to it. Was it a community of consciousness, a set of networks with processes and interactions, a con constituted whole? In each case, the law that made and enforced the order was itself imagined to be sufficiently orderly and coherent to hold it all together despite this hodgepodge of diverse ideas about law that had gone into creating it in the first place. We had the professional techniques, so affirmed the International Law Commission, to manage dissonance and fragmentation. Unfortunately, however, dissonance didn't disappear. Interests and perspectives diverge, and increasingly so, not only against, but within the order. And the second unfortunate idea was that law, however embedded in all those networks and institutions, also somehow stood above them, outside or beyond international politics and economics. Law was not only a fact, after all, but it was a norm. Rules of the road, guardrails for political conflict, and a platform for a global market. We dreamed of law as a kind of ersatz global sovereign, or reassuring father, at once problem solver and ethical lodestar. But there is no global interest aggregator up there attending to the world public interest. And third, the idea that law is good. It's on the right side of things on the whole. It protects the environment, resolves dispute, reduces the violence of war. But sadly, law also comforts the environmental despoiler, protects private right from public power, and heightens the intensity of disputes when all sides believe their cause is legal and just. Looking back, I think people credited law with so many magical powers because they felt they had to. I mean, it was Kelsen, after all, who most eloquently asked us to recognize, to choose to recognize, that only what he called the efficacy of the legal order underwrote the legal order. We should choose, as a matter of professional faith, to see all that disaggregated political and economic activity as legal, law-abiding, law-creating, 
After all, we'd had politics in the 20th century, and we knew where that led. What was needed was law, and to get there, we needed to see it, affirm it, believe in it, and we'd make it true. Well, this project was very successful. Uh, we do see law everywhere, and law is everywhere. But now we find ourselves beset by some very 21st century worries. And let me mention just a few. First, a worry about the possibility, not of law, but of politics in our technocratic world. Where is the opportunity to contest things, to participate in the making of winners and losers? What happened to sovereignty? Sovereignty is decentralization, local control, ownership of decisions which matter. If in 1918 one could yearn for law and commit oneself to intellectual activity to generate a feeling that it existed, in 2018 the problem seems the reverse. Somehow an unbridgeable gap has arisen between territorial politics and a global economy, a gap underwritten by law and all the practices of elite managerialism. In so dispersed a system, there's just no addressee for complaint. I remember the years I worked in Brussels. Wherever you went, nobody had ever decided anything. The commission thought it all happened in the council. The member states blamed the commission. The parliament thought things had been pre-cooked in the technical working groups and so on around the town. And on a global scale, the nominally public actors today seemed captured by private interest. But if you ask corporate managers or investors, they also feel constrained by regulation, by their mandate, by the competition. National governments seem displaced by global institutions and commitments, but if you go there, they talk about the pressures of member states in national politics. So that's a first worry. A second 21st century worry would be a worry about law itself, really. Does coherence, <coughs> about coherence and somehow the persistence of pluralism. Does it all really add up? The experience of pluralism, of confrontation with an alternative one can't balance away or exclude as satisfactorily other has become ever more prevalent for all the talk about systems and constitutions and professional techniques of interpretation. And a worry about law's effectiveness. For all the talk about problem solving, can the international legal order actually respond to the problems newly understood to be global, environmental harm, humanitarian crises, permanent war around the borders of the old order, terrorism, all the challenges of a digitally connected and artificially intelligent economic and social world? The solutions and reforms seem meager. Apologetic promises, the international community, a village of Potemkin remedies. And then a worry about law's virtue. Even virtuous projects do have dark sides. Human rights, development, humanitarianism, pursuing these things keeps getting us in trouble in a world of unintended consequences and sharply divergent national ethical visions. And here, I get to quote Montesquieu, because it's the Montesquieu lecture, even though it's not in the Montesquieu building. He did know this, and his most famous quote, at which you are, with which you're all familiar, is, there's no tyranny more cruel than that perpetrated under the shield of law and in the name of justice. Well, somehow dreaming, we forgot that. And finally, a worry about law's role in things we deplore. Law is a strategic asset in war, lawfare. Or take inequality. People talk about structural inequality, inequality rooted in structures which reinforce power, differences in bargaining power, patterns of honor and shame, deserving and undeserving. But what are those structures other than the very legal, economic, and political arrangements we were dreaming about? It's not surprising that the study of colonialism should seem ever more useful today. After all, the promise that everyone can play is terribly misleading. If you're a powerful player, a world with no center, no logic beyond the continual press of interests across thousands of dispersed settings is great. It looks like opportunity. The opportunity to strategize across a very wide terrain, to consolidate your market share, promote shared values, ensure the security of friends and allies. But if you're not a powerful player, all those opportunities are your vulnerabilities. From the periphery, whether that's in Bangladesh or a forgotten region of England or Arkansas, the global game is a lot more difficult to play. So if you find yourself waking up now in the 21st century to worries like these, let me suggest in the remainder of the time we have three habits of mind that might help us identify alternatives that are worth pursuing. First, um, a habit to encourage. Imagine the world less as a system than as a struggle. Take a break from the idea that it's ordered. 
Although the social sciences often start with conflict, a Hobbesian state of nature or the competitive market of Adam Smith, they work really hard to explain how things nevertheless turn out well-ordered through a balance of power or an invisible hand or something like that. They're equilibrium theories, ultimately. But much can be learned if we step back from this urge to systematize and think of international affairs rather as what happens when people everywhere engage one another with little backpacks of power and entitlements and vulnerabilities and have at it. People struggle over political and economic arrangements because they can be put together in lots of different ways. I mean, a couple of examples, it's really easy to forget. The international financial institutions started off supporting capital controls and import substitution industrialization before they became the voice of free movement and austerity. The human rights movement, led by Amnesty International, started off, as the name suggests, favoring amnesty before it embraced criminal justice as the first response to deviation from its purportedly global standards. Although the EU has always been an ordo-liberal affair of free movement, the meaning and strategy for social policy has shifted wildly with broader changes in membership and elite ideology. Now, I don't mean by this that everybody's always fighting. Most struggles have already been won or lost, and you don't have to re-engage them. Winners can simply press the outcomes on losers as facts about the status quo or the status of forces. To stand on prerogative or principle is also to stand on a well-consolidated victory. Even the turns and opportunities for collaborative activity will have been wrought in a prior conflict, and collaboration may itself aim to defeat some third party. And people today are just as ruthless about this as they always were. When US Treasury Secretary John Connolly advised President Nixon, this was when I was a student, to decouple the dollar from gold, he's reported to have said, my philosophy is that all foreigners are out to screw us, and it's our job to screw them first. Well, it's not only our current president, and not only Americans who talk like this. And this won't be new um, to those for whom the world order was always more struggle than system to people who never shared the dream, whose problems were not addressed, whose conflicts were not being managed, who always saw the global order reinforcing inequality and consolidating their vulnerability. But here's the interesting thing. Nor will it be new to strategic actors right at the center of things. In my experience, if you ask leading businessmen or politicians to describe the world, they'll talk about order, spinning an elaborate picture of how things work. But if you ask them what they're doing, about their projects, about threats and opportunities, system thinking fades away. They start speaking strategically, attentive to multiple overlapping, overlapping institutions and modes of engagement. And savvy actors are always moving the goalposts, transforming public into private interest and back, economics into politics, local into global, shifting, affirming, undermining, or ignoring what have seemed systemic limits. It's not that changing the game is easy. Actually, it's quite difficult to be savvy and strategic. And when you are, people resist. That's why things are so much more sustainable than many fear. But it's surprisingly easy to underestimate opportunities to shake up the system and to be surprised when it occurs, or to focus only on moments of dramatic change, revolutionary breaks in science or political life, rather than quotidian distributional struggles that actually alter things quite substantially. If we can learn to see systemic regularities the way they once appeared to the strategic actors who established them, as opportunities for gain or moments of vulnerability as victories or defeats, we'll avoid the tendency to canonize the particular arrangements we have as order itself. So how can we get better at identifying and pursuing alternatives? To figure that out, we've got to understand how people struggle how they understand the terrain, their modes of engagement, the forces that shape their authority or lead them to yield. Which takes me to my second theme and second habit of mind to encourage. Attention to the world-making power of ideas, the practices by which knowledge becomes power in struggle. It's not that our managerial world has replaced violence with arguments. Uh, I'm sure people do get persuaded by arguments sometimes, but seems pretty rare in my experience, both in my family and also in my life. Nevertheless, it's surprising how much political and economic struggle is undertaken by articulation and performance, by asserting powers and rights, attributing identities and responsibilities, articulating reasons and necessities. People in struggle neither talk one another into things nor simply bash one another on the head. They bring leverage to bear, a complex amalgam of assertions, 
backed up by more or less tacit threats. Persuasion and coercion are somehow impossible to untangle in a world when people drop bombs to send messages or transform economic power into market dominance through negotiation. So here, George Kennan was an American diplomat, and in 1946, he apparently said to students at the American Naval War College, you have no idea how much it contributes to the general politeness and pleasantness of diplomacy when you have a little quiet armed force in the background. So we might imagine the exercise of articulative power as a kind of work, as a practice, explaining to somebody, maybe standing right over them and looking at them like that, um, what facts or norms require them to do or to decide, and then interpreting what they did and pressing it back into the fabric of norm and fact for the next time. And as such, the operation of what's sometimes fancily called power knowledge is an everyday experience. Somebody comes to you, explains how things are and what has to happen as a result. They assert their authority or exercise entitlements, and you yield. Or you respond, and they yield. And when the dust settles, somebody's been put out of business, closed out of a market, prevented from crossing a border by somebody else's claims and assertions. Now, there are a lot of things we don't understand about the way knowledge becomes power in our world, but let me offer some preliminary observations, more kind of hypotheses for further study, if you like. A first observation would be that the material people bring to bear in this work, in their struggles with one another, is more loose argo than tight analytic. Struggling for gain, people draw on a mix of big ideas, historical precedents, principles, rules, cultural expectations, and allegorical morality tales. They deploy a kind of mashup of argument fragments, rules of thumb, that are only loosely tethered to various knowledge disciplines. Law, but also economics, political science, history, or natural science. The norms and facts people invoke require interpretation, moreover. They're malleable, open to disagreement. They've been midwifed by earlier struggles, which could be refought over their status. And that's all why technical experts are so often identifiable by national or ideological propensity, and why we so easily see what we think of as the interests behind claims to represent ethical universals or simply to be stating the facts. Now, there are a lot of places you can go to get professional training in these combative arts. You can go to law school, business school, schools of public policy. But you can also learn a lot just by watching television and browsing around in your social media feed. Professional and lay people share more than either group may realize, in part because everybody is learning to engage iteratively, attentive to one another, trying to be like and perform to the authority of the other. There are, of course, different styles which can be practiced and managed, mastered. Insiders and outsiders, hegemons and colonial elites, each find ways to participate in or resist the conversation. Human rights workers learn to oscillate between a kind of strategic pragmatism and ethical denunciation. That's their style. Economic development experts blend ideas about economics, society, law, and institutions into this weird mix of global recipe and deference to local context and political choice. That's their style. But in all these settings, the knowledge which becomes power is human knowledge, a blend of conscious, semi-conscious, and wholly unconscious ideas full of tensions and contradictions. The comforting idea that the people in power are bringing agreed norms or settled facts to bear on common problems screens out the human discretion in the way we're governed and screens out the chaos in the ideas being brought to bear. When people decry the advent of post-truth politics or the erosion of a universal ethical vocabulary, they're also congratulating themselves for normally being rational, objective, reasonable in identifying and implementing pragmatic action in the public interest, as if norms and facts, rather than real people, were normally responsible for the outcomes, as if what's going on is governance not rent-seeking or nest-feathering, not reinforcing some private interests against others, not reinforcing inequality or consolidating social power while managing dissent, not managing an entertainment spectacle, but governance. The interesting point is how a hodgepodge of human knowledge hangs together as a, as a practice of power, how contradictory and inconclusive knowledge has effects, how it shapes and limits our governance culture. And here, there's lots we don't quite get yet. But there, for example, I mean, are there patterns? 
a kind of grammar holding so many diverse fragments into effective exercises of articulative power? How does a governance vocabulary that seems so loose when you look at it, able to take anything and everything into account, miss so much? Well, two places to look where we might figure this out. First, in all that's actively unknown by people who rule, what's framed out as insignificant or uninteresting in ways which make some lives matter and the sacrifice of many others an unfortunate matter of fact rather than the result of a choice. And all the stuff that's taken for granted, ideas which lie beneath technical or ideological arguments, somewhere in common sense, ideas like the world is flat, making it unlikely somebody might try to sail around it, at least until the idea is brought forward and contested and somebody tries something. Now, although we know these framing notions are terribly important, we rarely study them head on. Yet people are always trying to put new stuff in our unconscious. Stuff like it's a flat world, or globalization, or the necessities of a balance of power, or a global market, or global warming, or the Anthropocene. And we might understand the human rights movement, or neoliberalism for that matter, as an effort to adjust our taken for granted notions of what government is and can do, an effort to change our background consciousness. Or say you're interested in the relationship between polity and economy. Law school will train you to contest the thousands of technical issues of degree which go into making the state a bit more powerful over this, a bit less over that, as well as the large ideological positions that can be dragged in to justify these technical differences. Politics and economics should be separated for these reasons, should be linked for these other reasons. But all this ideological and technical work goes forward in the shadow of stories people tell themselves about the world, stories about what an economy is, what politics can accomplish, as well as stories about the purposes and potential of law that are harder to address or investigate head on. Stories which make some problems visible, some actors central, and others invisible before we get to the choices embedded in technical and ideological disagreement. A second place to look in the powers that create injustice. The things you learn you really can't say in polite company. Even the most malleable technical and ideological material has limits, follows pathways, sets boundaries on public reason. These days, for example, you can't say God has authorized your victory any more than you can just take things by brute force. You've got to have a reason, a reason of principle, a reason of entitlement, an appeal to the universal, some professionally forged justification for your coercion. Now, you can push against these boundaries, and they're constantly being remade, but to struggle, you need to know where the boundaries are. And they establish a kind of bandwidth around what politics can accomplish, what economies can become. My hunch is that a combination of semi-conscious common sense and the structured limits of even the most malleable material in the professional consciousness of those who rule accounts for the unfortunate sense that while everything's being taken into account, everywhere we see issues that are left out and problems which escape our grasp. Well, one further observation about global articulative power and how it works. In studying legal expertise, I stumbled on a kind of weirdo axiom. As law became ever more diverse or plural, it also became more prevalent or widespread. And this seems true for many forms of global expertise. The less decisive, determinative, or univocal and expert vocabulary, the more prevalent it becomes. Perhaps because porous vocabularies can be harnessed in principal disagreement as readily as pragmatic settlement. Or because in a plural world, people are constantly probing, testing for facts that might be reframed as decisions, maneuvering for authority to act on the basis of other realities. And as they do, the vocabularies they share become ever more internally diverse. But this porosity helps explain the sense of pragmatic disenchantment that's so common among global elites when you meet them. A kind of disbelief in all the details anchored by faith in the virtue and objectivity of the vocabulary as a, whole, as a whole. It may be simply that over time, people who use the available vocabularies come to grasp their plasticity, their potential for strategic use, and the vulnerability of even the firmest framing conventions, but they continue to find them useful, perhaps more useful. And the result is a kind of doubled sensibility at once believing and strategizing which makes it easy to speak truth to power in the morning and then deal with them in the afternoon more pragmatically. 
or to imagine other people being persuaded by claims that you know, and presumably they should also know, are really just arguments. Much about this sensibility remains a pu puzzle. We know the incidence of anti-foundational pragmatics varies over time and among professions, and its rise is not a one-way ratchet. Thinking like a lawyer once meant being able to solve complex cases by formal categorization and logical deduction. A half a century later, it was difficult to get an A in law school if you tried to do that. Thinking like a lawyer had come to mean skill in establishing and unraveling the categories, constructing and demolishing, demolishing chains of deductive logic. But then a generation later, clear, reliable rules are all the rage again. Economists, psychologists, scientists all have their own histories with analytic certainty and doubt, consensus and method war. <clears throat> For some elites and in some professions and in some institutional settings, overt embrace of sophisticated pragmatic skepticism is a badge of honor. For others, that's only the sort of thing you could share with a friend over a beer. And of course, there are still others who cling to their analytics doggedly, all doubts inaccessible between a persistent conscious certainty. As a result, the distribution of certainty and doubt, of strategic flexibility and persistence, bears further study. If jaded sophistication varied with the distance from the commanding heights, for example, it would be interesting to know. And it's certainly often imagined that people far from power are more gullible to its claims than those at the center of things. But I'm not sure, certain about that. One certainly finds dogmatists in the corridors of power and people on the receiving end of authority who appreciate its plasticity. It may just be that the hoi polloi are jaded and sophisticated in a different way. For one thing, they've been trained in savvy listening by media talking heads explaining to them what's really going on when leaders make this or that claim. Heard in this way, with the commentator beside you telling you what's happening, elites can sound cavalier about the gravest moral issues even when, or particularly when, they also sound self-righteous, lecturing about values and moral bankruptcy and stuff like that. For all the sound and fury on television and the social media over lunch, we people, I think, also realize it's somehow not serious, that people are just mobilizing facts and ideas strategically. Listening, it's easy to conclude the vocabularies for exercising power are a lot of nonsense. You can learn to use them, have to listen to it, but you can also doubt that it's anything other than self-justification. It's hard not to think something else is going on, and this is fuel for politics in a really paranoid style. For the idea that Trump doesn't really mean what he emphatically keems, seems to keep saying. And once you start thinking like that, it's easy to imagine that, the only th that only the things which can't be said, which are politically incorrect, are authentic, important, and what you really believe. Well, this is also a kind of jaded sophistication, if a really unfortunate one. So let me now turn to the final third habit of mind I mean to encourage, attention to law's role in all this um, in the, and in the distrib ubiquitous distributive effects that, that come about when people engage in articulative power. Law is actually a great place to explore the global exercise of this kind of authority. The world is awash in legal claims and norms and procedures which are tools for distributive struggle, records of past victories and defeats, a vocabulary of assertion and dispute with its own blind spots and biases, a blanket of legitimacy thrown over the whole thing. Rather than thinking of law as an ordering system structuring device, we might study it by focusing on what people do to one another by asserting rules, invoking powers, or developing legal justifications. Doing so would place law's losers alongside its winners and give us a really different picture of the losers. They haven't been left out, they've been defeated. And it might make visible law's darker contributions to injustice and disempowerment and strengthen our ability to identify legal changes that could alter the way wealth and status are allocated. We know that legal rules, arguments, and institutions make it possible for people to exclude somebody else, capture and retain gains from economic or cultural activity, legitimate the outcome as order rather than victory. We know that although we imagine gains from trade, for example, to be distributed by facts, facts like bargaining power, the relative productivity of factors, the competitiveness of actors, what we call bargaining power or competitiveness depends on the legal and institutional arrangements 
that affect things like cost of production, barriers to entry, and so on. That's why people struggle over those things. We know law is in the background of the distribution and of, of uh, resources and in the reproduction of inequalities we find unsatisfactory. I mean, after all, how is value distributed across a complex value chain? Multinationals readily assess such things to lobby for rules that will consolidate their market power and close out rivals. Teams of lawyers work to identify levers to place income here and losses there for all kinds of distributive purposes. Patterns of dynamic inequality also have legal roots when law consolidates the relative powers of centers able to compound their advantage over lagging peripheries. When legal arrangements speed or impede flows of capital goods and persons, accentuating the forces which leave some communities behind while others speed ahead. As a result, legal arrangements offer a kind of red thread to unravel the mystery of inequality. If global inequality is structural, that structure can be observed and contested in law. A history of law's role in domination and distribution would illuminate the way regimes which seem impartial, impartial, even benevolent, participate in making an unjust world. The legal institutions of the European Union and London financial hegemony, for example, are not only avatars of peace and stability. They establish hierarchies of haves and have-nots when monetary union becomes a recipe for debt bondage, or when free movement from the periphery and, and social free movement for the periphery and in the periphery, and social protection at the center becomes an engine for relative wealth and stagnation. To figure out how this happens, we're going to have to dive into legal details. But from colonial governance to bilateral investment trees, treaties, the arrangements allowing winners to consolidate gains and establish dynamics of inequality between centers and peripheries are legal. Then as now, legal institutions solidify the distribution of rents from global economic activity and consolidate the political authority of those committed to the stability of that outcome. Law also distributes when it infiltrates our common sense about the world, about the powers that be, the distributions that are just, that are natural, and when the consciousness of legal professionals limits the arguments that can be made, the interests that can be heard. Although our sociological tools to identify law's world-making effects are pretty rudimentary, sometimes it's very straightforward. When legal regimes transform past might into present right, that can be articulated as fact. Easy example. The UN Charter cemented the status of the post-45 victorious powers as the great powers for all kinds of purposes. Although legal work arranges time as much as space, configuring who's up to date, who's behind, law's world-making impact may be easiest to grasp geographically. Let me give you a couple of, of examples before concluding. People use international legal materials and arguments to mark national boundaries, make special spaces subject to special rules, free trade zone, detention center, and so forth. Once these spaces have been identified, things proper to each can be ordered and arranged. And just as people become their legal status, he is a refugee, she is an economic migrant, so places become their legal regimes. That is the high seas, that is national territory, and so on. The legal arrangements constituting the zones fade, as the spaces come to be taken for granted. Now, law's role in this can sometimes be obscured by the fact that law is so often also the tool for rendering borders porous or linking otherwise distinct spaces. And when this happens, it's really easy to imagine that the difference comes from someplace else. But legal disputes about boundaries can also reinforce the notion that spaces they separate are distinct, the line between them wherever it settles a natural one. And here, another example from Europe. Take, take the boundaries of Europe. European elites have established, as you all know, kind of complex, crazy mashup of legal regimes to broaden and narrow what counts as inside and outside for different purposes. The EU is now this pastiche of spaces, the variable geometry of the Eurozone, the Schengen area, NATO, the European stability mechanism, the Troika, its clients in Greece and Cyprus, association agreements, bilateral and multilateral trade agreements, and so forth. Lots of boundary issues remain thorny, relations with Turkey, for example. Nevertheless, or precisely as a result, people across the world have come to take for granted that there's a space called Europe, rooted in facts of history and geography, which sets limits on elite political imagination in concentric circles from Brussels outward, the Benelux, the Rhine, the original members, the older members, well, not Britain, the associated nations, those on a pathway to membership, and so on. 
So if Turkish relations with the EU are awkward, it seems obvious that geographical facts and cultural differences make membership for Israel or Palestine or Tunisia or Libya impossible, however beneficial it might be for everybody. They're just not Europe. But they could be Europe, of course, just as Malta and small islands scattered all around the oceans are already Europe, or as Gibraltar is part of Britain and so on. In fact, actually not that long ago, all those places were part of Europe. But for now, however, the facts are clear. They are not and therefore can't be. Or take the distinction between the global political order and the global economy. We imagine the first territorially, political order, the second a kind of space floating above the marked territories of sovereign authority. But we know that the global economy is everywhere entangled with politics, supported and impeded by all kinds of national institutions and legal rules. The boundary between the political public and the economic private is constantly being remade. Nowhere do we find one without the other. And most legal work about them concerns their links and reciprocal influences, structuring transnational public-private partnerships, harnessing sovereign debtors to private creditors, establishing public regulation of private activity, or bringing public power to bear in defense of private right. Now, it's very difficult to isolate this empirically, but law's intense boundary work does seem to strengthen the common sense idea that international political and economic life are naturally different. They take place in alternative imaginary spaces. They have distinct logics. That's why we have to go through all this work to try to connect them up. The difference is reinforced by limits which seem implicit in legal reasoning about the connections. So in a world where private rights travel and public policies don't, just to take one example, although you can organize labor globally, it's really hard to do it. Just as you can get investors to take a haircut, but that's also really hard to do. So wherever spaces allocate power and privilege, people have a reason to contest them. The West and the rest, North and the South, and usually the struggle is over the boundary. There are civilized and uncivilized spaces, but my culture actually belongs on the civilized side, just so you know. But sometimes, however, people also struggle to overturn the distinction. The world is not organized around levels of civilization. All states are or should be equal, and it can then be difficult to shift it from one mode of opposition to another. A quick example, again, from Europe, the history of center periphery struggle in the EU as it moved from east-west to north-south. So after 1989, Brussels elites created this kind of imaginary Europe that went from Scotland to Slovakia by placing the East and the West um, in different historical times, countries which had arrived in modern market capitalism and those which still had a long way to go to catch up. And it seemed clear that complex social protections natural in the West would be premature in Eastern economies that required the shock of free trade at market prices to jumpstart their modernization. There was a lot of struggle about who was where on the pathway to full membership in the social welfare state, but there seemed little room to dispute the apparent inevitability of a spatial and a temporal hierarchy between the people who had to survive in free trade and the people who could have a cozy welfare state. But then, the long struggle over austerity debt in the euro, which followed the global financial crisis, shifted the frame. It began to seem that the difference between Europe's north and south, at least, lay not in a hierarchy of development, but in a political struggle between unmatched forces with different priorities. And as the crisis ground on, national political elites in Spain, Italy, and elsewhere needed a strategy about the baseline. Should they do all they could to be on the right side of the line, or should they join with Greece to overturn the framework of distinction? Ultimately, they chose the former. But not because the latter was invisible, it was just a greater stretch for them to figure out how to do it. it seemed liable to unsettle things in unpredictable ways. So a better grasp of law's distributive significance might open the range of alternatives and reduce this sense of stretch when such kind of thing appears. So what does all this tell us about the potential to change the world? Um, well, it can be done. So it's frustrating when the center claims already to have taken everything into account. It leaves very little room for those who have other interests or concerns, people who want to change things. Even the emancipatory potential of social movements, feminism, human rights, and so on, are routinely transformed into governance projects of their own. And so what can you do if you want to change things? Well, you can go back. You can say, well, let's go back to sovereignty and local control and the politics you remember and like Brexit. But there is no Brexit. 
there's only an endless negotiation of a thousand technical questions. And eventually, there might be Canada. It can seem we have only the current arrangements or the power of no, of religion in a secular world, of nationalism, tribalism, racism against the cosmopolitan order. Well, it's certainly true that the room for national initiative and experimentation has been eroded by globalization. Free movement of goods and services does make territorial regulation more difficult. The erosion of the tax base everywhere has bound sovereigns to the serv in service to global investors. But these things weren't inevitable. They were made. Victories over alternatives within the post-war order. And one of the tragedies of our contemporary situation is a collective amnesia about the very real alternatives lying around us. An entire history of heterodox analyses, proposals, and real life experiences. After all, wherever there was struggle, there were alternatives. Not just between the modest reformism of elite management and outsider agitation, but alternative voices and perspectives and possible arrangements within what came to feel like an unchangeable order. Where money, credit, labor, and capital, political power and right had been legally constructed, there was a moment when they could have been legally constructed differently. Had they been, the legal boundaries between economics and politics or between public and private actors might be some other way. And then that might seem normal and counterfactual. I mean, just take the gulf between a global economy flying around and a national politics. We, it doesn't have to be that way. We know how to link economic life to territory and community, just as we know how to distribute opportunities for political choice across institutions beyond the national capital and the professionals we call politicians. It's been done before. But to get there, we would need to reorient expert work from managing the separation of economics and politics to arranging their connection. It's not that we lack the ability to arrange distribution in some other way when we want to. I mean, consider the very fashionable notion that every country should become Silicon Valley, um, where my uncle lives. Well, I've heard this actually all over the place. Um, in Russia, Kazakhstan, Doha, Mexico, China, it's astonishing the number of people who think they could be the next Silicon Valley. Maybe Tilburg is going to be the next Silicon Valley. And in each case, the tools people intend to use are legal and administrative changes reallocating opportunities to garner rent in the name of social transformation, adjusting rules on credit, education policy, immigration, intellectual property, local autonomy, expert, export and import licensing, turning the levers of state power and private authority to allocate gains to those who would innovate as they'd once been turned to those who would industrialize. By changing the rules, the good guys, investors, innovators, entrepreneurs, the millennials, national champions, would be strengthened and the society transformed. Well, we might learn to approach global order with a similar sense for its plasticity, the machinery to link the dispossessed productively to companies and nations which benefit from global markets, mobilities, and technologies isn't mysterious. Those who've ensured their disconnection know how it could have been done. Just as we could disperse sites for political engagements, we could reshuffle legal arrangements to mitigate dualist dynamics. Think about local content, employment, technology transfer, investment requirements that link firms benefiting from privileged market access or free trade zones to their periphery. Or corporate mandates that prioritize links with communities or unions alongside shareholders, lending requirements, targeting credit to peripheral actors, zoning practices, linking an office tower downtown with the establishment of a shipping facility in the ghetto, and so on. Corporations could be discouraged from offloading workers on national states for tax and transfer welfare and encouraged, or required, to find something for these workers to productively do. Capital flight could be restrained. Capital investment in developing nations required. Go slow provisions could prevent rapid in and outflows of speculative capital in thin peripheral markets, and so on. By tracing the impact of legal arrangements on political and economic trajectories, we might illuminate alternative directions for the routine work of managing the system, adjusting the entitlements and expectations that link people in relationships of relative privilege and vulnerability. But first, of course, like strategic actors everywhere, we need to understand and remember how law distributes. Now, rearranging things and picking up these alternatives won't be easy. We'll need to be savvy and strategic. People will resist. Rearranging the world will require struggle, struggle on the terrain where inequality is established and maintained. But this isn't a matter of outsider populism, nor of detached academic reflection. It's a matter, in Max Weber's words, of strong, slow drilling through the hard boards of institutional arrangements 
where modern expert rule takes place. I propose we get started. Thanks very much. Look forward to the discussion.